Let's pray a moment. Lord, we thank you that we can hear your word, that we can reflect on it, that you desire to know us and be with us. We pray, Lord, that in the next few minutes, we would be able to understand your meaning for us that we would be refreshed and renewed and changed for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The text this week might strike those of you who come every week or join us every week as a bizarre decision here. Didn't we just do communion last week? Why are we still talking about bread? Haven't we done that for like four weeks in a row now? For the more pessimistic among you, is this guy already out of stuff to preach? He just got here. We're really making a meal of this, aren't we? For those who like puns. Yes and no. We've taken a long time to get to this. The speech actually started in 626, and it's taken a long time. One commentator says it's the way that John does theology ideas recur they repeat and then you hold them up to the light and you look at different angles and they're like a jewel and you see something different as you go we're also making a meal of it because that's what jesus did he just droned on and on and on at this point and yes we had communion last week and no we're not having it this week and that's actually important I want you to recognize here that we sometimes become so familiar with church and with ritual and so familiar with the Bible and with Jesus that we kind of forget what's actually going on. This passage that we just heard from John is often thought of as a communion text. It speaks of Jesus, his flesh and his blood and our consuming it. Therefore, got to be about communion, right? But here's the thing, even though some of your study Bibles are going to say it's about communion, even though commentators sometimes think it's about communion, and even though sometimes sermons look at this passage and say it's about communion, the fact of the matter is it's not about communion. Remember, John is writing the last of the Gospels. The other ones already did the Last Supper. They've already explained it. Jesus sits with his friends, does his thing. And the ritual is already taking place. So when the church gathers together in Paul's early letters, they're already breaking bread before John writes this gospel. You see, if you do something once in church, you have to do it that way forever. That's the rule. And so they were already doing communion. John didn't need to put it down again. That's a joke, by the way. We don't have to do everything forever, but we do get into that, don't we? It's also worth remembering at this point in the story, if this passage is only about communion, not a single person who heard Jesus talking would have been able to make heads or tails of it because the Last Supper is in the future. So nobody Jesus was talking to would have grasped what he was talking about. So it can't just be or it can't primarily be about communion. Instead, John is trying to make sure the early church understands what it's doing, why it does what it does, the importance of the practices it's taking on. And in the story, Jesus is explaining this important truth about who he is and what he came to do. When it comes to communion, which we do at this table, there's been battles, serious battles about what to happen. Some of them are super recent. There are many people with very strong opinions about whether or not it's okay to do communion over Zoom or in any other format than being in person together. Congregations are ripping up over this. Denominations are fighting over this. What we do in communion matters deeply. In history, people have died over how to do communion. Denominations have started over how to do communion. Denominations have then split over how to do communion. And my hunch is that happened in the very beginning of the church and hasn't gone away. You used to know what type of person you were looking at based on what they thought happened at communion, if they were Catholic, Lutheran, Reformed, Baptist, whatever. We saw last week, Jesus introduced the notion that his flesh, his body, was going to be a sacrifice. He said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats the bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. That's where we left off. So then how do the people respond to that? 
they began to argue sharply among themselves. Not just with Jesus, right? They're fighting together now. That's the way a church. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? You see, there's a debate here because they're smart enough to know Jesus is not promoting cannibalism. If for no other reason, then he's too small to feed that many people off his one carcass. And so they have to interpret what he's saying, and that's where you get into the fights. Cannibalism, to be clear, has largely been looked down on in history by basically everybody. The Jews were actually particular about this one. They had a thing where they would say in Leviticus, they had special rules about this, do not eat any meat with the blood still in it. They were particularly fastidious about how to eat meat, how you kill the animal, how you prepare the animal. You sure don't do it with blood still in it. Blood is the vehicle of life itself. It is sacred. It's holy. You don't consume it. How could you eat a human being? Jesus must be doing something else here. And of course, Jesus knows that, right? He knows Leviticus. He knows all the hangups. He knows all the taboos about eating meat. So what does he do? He understands the sensitivity. And this is where you got to love Jesus. And you got to get used to him surprising you because understanding how sensitive everybody is about this. He says, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man, which he's already said, and drink his blood, he pokes them. See that? You're not allowed to have the blood. And what does he do? He adds blood to flesh. He's already made them argue amongst each other. How could you eat his flesh? And then he doubles down and not just doubles down. He does it again and again and again. And he says it four times in a row, making absolutely certain, absolutely everybody now is going to be fighting about how are we going to drink the blood of this guy? We're not allowed to drink any blood, period. What is going on here? We are a far cry from him being in an upper room with his buddies having a last meal, aren't we? You got to understand the biblical notion of sacrifice. And that's why we read the passage about David in 2 Samuel. I don't know if you paid attention to that. The story is that David is there with his friends and they're fighting and they're trying to take this land. It's hot out. You know, it's a pretty tough place. He's thirsty. He, on a whim, says, you know, I'd sure like a drink from this special fountain. You know, everybody knows where the fountain is. And his three superstar hero warrior type guys, they hear him. And they want him to love them. They want him to appreciate them. They want to show how much they appreciate him, how willing they are to go up to bat for him. And so they very dangerously, they go and they get water from this well, and it's at great risk to themselves. And they come back and they're like, look, we did this for you. And they offer this thing to him, right? They're coming with this offering, this risk that they've taken, and he pours it out because he cannot take this risk. He says that their willingness to sacrifice themselves for his well-being is honorable, but it's beyond the pale. It's too far. He cannot accept the sacrifice, even though they made it out safely. What Jesus does when he says, I am the flesh and I am the bread, I am the sacrifice, is he flips that story and he says to all of his buddies, I'm going to give you my blood that your eternal thirst will be taken care of. And so the question he's putting to people is, will we be like David and unable or unwilling to accept the sacrifice? I just finished a book about a guy. He's from Scotland. He's a 20-something, and he's getting into a lot of trouble in life. And he decides to clean himself up, and he's trying to think, like, what's going to work? And his parents are freaking out. What are we going to do with this guy? And he dreams up this idea. He's going to bike around the world. It's going to take years. He's going to clean himself up. He's going to have great adventures. And off he goes. He has basically no money. And he's on a pretty strict timeline because he has no money. And he's biking up through a mountain pass in like the really, this really poor country. And he hears a kitten meowing, like a tiny kitten. And he's got his bike, and it's weighing like 100 pounds. He's got all this stuff for his whole year, right? So the kitten, small as it is, can keep up with him. And so this goes on for a while, and this little cat keeps meowing and meowing, and he's looking, at it, and the cat is so pathetic. He's like, if, if I don't pick up this cat, it's going to die out here. 
he doesn't understand what it would mean to like travel with a cat on a bike. I, I don't know what that would mean. My cats probably wouldn't do it. But he, he picks up the cat, decides he, he can't leave it to die by the side of the road. He's going to take care of it. And he's near a border. And so he smushes the cat in like a bag on the front of his back bike and hopes it's quiet enough that he can smuggle her into this country. And there's all armed guards and stuff. You know, he's terrified. And he sneaks her in. And as he does, he realizes that he's going to have to start taking care of her. He's going to have to slow down. He's going to have to die to all of his plans in order to take care of the cat. He finds out there's this thing called the animal passport. So every time you want to leave a country, you have to get a vet in that country to sign off that the, the animal's okay. So he goes to this vet and very quickly, he's now totally out of money because vets are not free. And this guy didn't start with a lot of money. So now he's trying to make legal border crossings. He's out of money. He's got this cat. He's taking these videos. He's showing his family and friends these videos, right? And so he's got this little Instagram account. And all of a sudden, more than 800,000 people are following this guy with this cat because it's an adorable story, this guy with this kitten. People watch him as he goes around the world. They start raising money for all kinds of animal welfare organizations. Why do so many people love that kind of story? Partly because the internet loves cats. It's not an unbiased thing. The internet itself is about cats but also because we like heartwarming stories where one person makes a serious sacrifice for another. When somebody demonstrates the willingness to die to self, to die to the plans, to die to the goals that they've set, to sacrifice for the well-being of somebody else. We losing sound now? Uh, Okay. So what happens is Jesus here says, I'm going to die. My body will be the sacrifice. And in doing so, Jesus completes the cycle of life. He experiences the fullness of what it is to be human. He has friends. They die. He's sad. And then he himself will die. He offers himself as a meal for his followers. When we eat, whether we eat a plant or an animal, something has to die so that we can eat it and thus live. That's pretty basic. Jesus will die that we might live, and that's supposedly going to happen on the most daily basis. We're going to get bread. But it also on this cosmic level, he says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Another remains in that sentence is very hard, isn't it? Always has been. Whether because of persecution, abuse, boredom, apathy, remaining in the faith, remaining in Christ has always been hard. Jesus is calling his followers to believe in him, to believe in the sacrifice that he's going to offer, as though it has unique power to quench the thirst for eternity. He uses metaphor for believing wholly, completely in him in such a way that our very bodies are involved, like when we eat. Now, the Message Bible puts it this way. They say, come with a hearty appetite, a deep desire for Christ, something that can only be satisfied in a mysterious fashion. But when Jesus speaks of you, eat me, and then I abide in you, and you abide in me, he's changing the nature of eating. Do you see that? I think that points to the cosmic reality he's trying to make us aware of. Like if you eat chicken or if you eat kale, it abides in you, right? But there is no sense in which you abide in kale or you abide in chicken when you eat it. It enters you and is part of you, but you're not in a chicken. So... It's weird, right? Because the chicken ceases to exist or the kale ceases to exist, 
But with Jesus, you can eat him, and yet he continues to exist. That's mystery. Sort of like how we know that little cat does plenty for the soul of the lad who who saved her, right? The story is actually a two-way street. They're intimately tied together and connected. When Jesus doubles down and adds blood, I believe he's provocatively attempting to highlight the intimacy that's going to be involved in all of this. Like the mystical union that we look for sometime in the future with Jesus being a vine and we're branches, that kind of thing. He's talking about intimacy. Paul understood that. Paul wrote, I have been crucified with Christ. He hasn't been crucified. He's still writing. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. See that? Christ was crucified, not Paul. And yet Paul says, I was crucified because Christ is in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Because Christ did the sacrifice and I'm aware of it, it's like I was sacrificed and now we're one. When Jesus talks this way in John, he's saying something like, I am the Passover lamb, the one sacrificed for your sake. You will eat and drink of me the way you eat and drink at Passover meals. And when you do that, it will be the end of these things. Paul understood this overturned a lot of Jewish thought at the time. He saw Christ as bread. He saw Christ as lamb. He says, get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. The early church understood what Jesus was talking about here. Even though the people in this story fight. When Jesus says, just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He's making a very important point. He's worked up to it with a very long speech. He is to be the sacrifice and everybody else the recipient. David could not accept the possible sacrifice of his friends. That's called leadership, and that's probably good. Nala the cat, being a cat, had no problem accepting the sacrifice of the Scottish lad who just had to slow down his journey around the world. What Jesus is getting at is, I think, we are pretty much all like David and much less like Nala the cat. Jesus would have us be more like Nala, accepting our lot, recognizing that on our own, we're not going to survive, that we're not going to slake our thirsts or fulfill the things we crave. But with help, we can. So I'm suggesting to you today, if you take nothing else out of this, perhaps you can walk home with this, where you always hear Jesus as shepherd and church people as sheep, think about us as cats now. Because we actually know cats. People used to know sheep, and we don't know sheep anymore, but now we know cats. And cats accept whatever you'll give them. It's difficult for us because we want to earn it. And I want to ask a couple of questions that you should think about over the week, especially if you call yourself a Christian. Can you conceive of your life without Christ? What if there were no Christ? How would that change your life? Next week, we're going to wrestle with one of my absolute favorite passages of Scripture. And in that, we're going to see how people react and respond to what Jesus is doing here. But for now, the question is, how do you react and respond to what he's doing here? To someone saying that he will sacrifice himself to be for you. 
that you need to learn to come empty-handed saying you need the bread and he'll do it for you. Maybe you did this a long time ago and you still feel full. Maybe you need to ask to be filled again. And if you ask, surely you will. Maybe you're full to overflowing and you're trying to figure out how to share the bread because in COVID, that's hard. Wherever you are, there's a response required. You can't just ignore him. You can't just say he was speaking metaphorically and he didn't mean it. He's saying that you need to eat his body and blood. You need to accept the sacrifice that he made on your behalf. Let's pray that we'd be able to. Lord, we ask that we could possibly do this, that you would inspire us, that your Holy Spirit would renew our faith and our trust in you, that we would see our needs, see our thirsts, our hungers, our cravings, and that you would step right into them and fill us. Surprise us with your capacity to fill us. Humble us with the ability to say yes to accept the offering that you make for us. Only you can do this, Lord, not us. May we understand your word. May we understand your son and grab hold of the promises he makes. We ask it in Christ's most powerful name. Amen.